Making Sense Making Literacies is a series of three online CCW Dialogues events co-created with Wimbledon's 3D Lab. Workshops and exhibition spaces of both sides of Making Sense of embodied and cognitive research, usually separated by different points in the production line. The pandemic has upended the historically situational sites of making and showing. Technical workshops at the heart of the art college are creative labs where ideas evolve and coalesce through experimentation, embrace failings and collaborative problem solving. These conversations explore the intersubjective and shared spaces of thinking, making and showcasing through the lenses of staff from the CCW technical team. They provide a reflective space for staff to share experience of learning and teaching making practice and to showcase some of the creative workarounds they've devised over the last year, transferring essential workshop support structures into virtual holding spaces, enabling the student as maker with maker sensibilities wherever they are. Dialogues is a programme of events, talks and screenings that take place online during 2021. Devised in collaboration with Camberwell, Chelsea and Wimbledon Spaces, Dialogues are hosted remotely and connected via the Chelsea Space platform, which can be found at chelseaspace.org. 3D Lab guest sessions are online technical talks or collaborative workshops hosted by the 3D Lab based at Wimbledon College of Arts. We see conversations that reflect the richness of thinking through making, technical research and development, and practical learning and teaching. We aim to provide a learning resource and develop an archive for a community keen to articulate tacit knowledge and making literacies that underpin making practice. For previous sessions, please visit wca3dlab.myblog.arts.ac.uk or follow us at wca3dlab on Instagram. So today is a first in a series of talks called Making Sense, Making Literacies. And it's really a moment in time to kind of reflect on some of the uh, immense kind of challenges that we've met over this year and also to reflect on the nature of making and our approaches to making and whether things have changed or uh, pivoted in this year, which um, I think the answer is yes, it has. The kind of info kind of graphic we have for the session is that kind of familiar, this is up uh, or this way up sign, which you can kind of see uh, just behind me. This little um, sign has been on my wall probably since the beginning, uh, sort of late lock first lockdown, and it's constantly been on my wall uh, the whole time. And partly it is to reflect on, um, consistently reflect which way is up in this time of just com consistent change uh, and opportunity to really dig in deep as to how, uh, what is making look like? How do we enable students and people to be makers where they're at? Um, and also to start to articulate these, uh, uh, what we've become, come to call making literacies. Um, so that's just to share a little bit about the title, Making Sense, Making Literacies. Making Sense is this idea um, that the workshop and exhibition spaces are both sites of making sense in a way of, of embodied and cognitive research uh, and sort of embody a, a, diff a, a type of knowledge that sometimes we don't take time to reflect on and really give it the value that it's due. Um, so hopefully these sessions will will do that. Um, the making literacies is is something that um, the three D lab at Wimbledon has uh, sort of started to develop uh, this year in a sense of trying to really articulate those kind of tacit knowledge or, or approaches to making that we teach within workshop spaces um, that we've maybe not had time to kind of articulate and to transfer in such a way as what we've done in this past year um, that the pandemic's kind of forced us to do that really so we've come up with a working definition of making literacies uh, which is uh, what you see on the screen is making literacy is the ability to play explore understand interpret create communicate and make sense of the world using materials processes across digital and analog fabrication and we've just had a few suggestions of, of what that looks like. So being literate in making involves, but it's not limited to thinking through making and prototyping, understanding materials and their properties, ability to investigate how things are made and how they work, being able to problem solve, being able to communicate and transpose concepts and ideas into physical outcomes. And really that's not exhaustive. Um, we've definitely seen that there is hundreds more to add and start to articulate these things that we, we take for granted or not necessarily have the opportunity to express. 
Um, so I'm hoping that's getting your um, cognitive juices flowing and maybe reflecting on some things that you've been thinking about this year. So we have the absolute privilege of spending a bit of time with a few of um, our colleagues across CCW today. Uh, we have in the room with us James Perkins, uh, who is a lecturer in BA Theatre Design at Wimbledon. Fabian Lieb Perella, who's a senior lecturer in product and furniture design um, in Camberwell, although works across Chelsea, who has also worked very closely with Richard Barton, who's in the room with us today. Um, and Richard is kind of in between roles, um, but in um, sense of working very closely with Fabian in, in the last year has been the studio manager uh, for the material and uh, spatial practices program which is quite a large program across Camberwell and uh, Chelsea and very heavily making orientated. Um, so I'm just going to give um, the, uh, James, uh, Fabian and Richard just an opportunity uh, about five, five, seven minutes, just to give us an insight into the context, um, what is making look like in where the section of CCW that they've been looking at working in, uh, and maybe kind of share with us a bit of the challenges, uh, how they've met those, maybe how their approach to making a materiality has slightly changed um, or pivoted in some way. So I'm gonna hand over, firstly, uh, I can see James is raring to go on his video there. So I'm gonna go, James, could you give us sort of five, seven minutes just to think about your context um, and what making, look, what making looks like uh, in your context? Um, yeah, hi Ash. Uh, yeah, I can. Um, it's what is the what where's the place to start the place to start is just to flag and it's it's difficult because it's you and i having a conversation so so to kind of um to promote that seems a bit self-indulgent doesn't it but actually it is that the the thing that has been wonderful has been the dialogue between what might sometimes be seen as kind of uh, separated thinking and it's and it's happened it feels like all over all over wimbledon and all the interactions we've been having is that is that making has become has become in itself a, a, a conversation amongst us it's become a thing we can talk about and actually your definition there because it's because it's so wide reaching there's it doesn't matter what your specialization is there's a way into a shared language and a way into a to a shared way of um to a shared way of thinking uh, before one of the one of the quotes we use a lot um, with theatre design students is that I, I've, I've put this as a Paolo Antonelli quote uh, who was the curator of design at um, MoMA in New York um, she says good design is the combination of two or more seemingly opposing forces and I think that dialogue within good design is also a dialogue with between our specialities and I think a lot of the time when watching all of your 3D lab sessions it's about a dialogue between materials or it's about a dialogue between movement and static things in lots of kind of Will Waterhouse's things or it's about reframing things or seeing things from a different angle or exploring exploring different materials so that that in that definition, it implies that there are two things that it's a conversation between. But I think what I feel like we're learning in, in college as as a kind of as a group of both both educators and students is that actually those that combination happens everywhere. So it's it's like a web of interconnected. Things. One of the one of the really joyful, no real kind of light bulb moments for me was when when we were talking about kind of decal stuff and you went oh well even in the workshop even the tools we're using come from there is a cultural difference between the way this sort works and the way that sort works and you go oh great because because there is a temptation within a large organization you can sometimes feel like your specializations box you off and you go well i will go here for my decal conversations and i will go here for my book learning and I will go here for this other learning and you go actually it's it's not about those definitions and it's not about that compartmentalization it's about 
yes, you've got specialization here and a specialization here and a specialization here, but the joy happens in the, in the lines of communication between the specializations, between the expertise. And you go, it's in that moment of sharing where the real ideas happen. And so I think for me that, that definition of kind of what good design is, is all about that crossover moment and I feel like it's been great having, um, bringing in a meet to talk about paper folding, which you wouldn't necessarily think is a theater design specific kind of way of thinking, but actually the language he uses and how he explores pattern and he explores material and how he explores it in a kind of, um, the cultural side of his work and unpicking historic artifacts to try and understand the maker behind those artifacts. All of that is a is a is a universal way of thinking, is a kind of is an art school way of thinking that actually transcends. It doesn't matter what your speciality is, but that I feel like lots of our making conversations have just um, perhaps just kind of lifted the curtain on lots of those things. Have kind of have exposed have exposed the kind of the skeleton underneath, and it turns out lots of what we all do is absolutely connected it exists within this kind of within this interconnected framework so for me that's what's been really exciting and this last year it's been about we have had more conversations because it's easier sometimes it's difficult i don't like walking into offices that i don't know like it's, a, it's always a slightly awkward thing and you go am, am i allowed in this space whereas actually popping up in the background of a kind of a, a zoom call of a team's call is somehow a slightly easier thing so the fact the conversations have happened there some of us some of the people we've been collaborating with we've, we've never met kind of face to face and so I wonder whether in some ways as difficult as this has been there's been less stuff there's been less of that kind of visceral uh, kind of tactile but as far as starting the conversations perhaps this has freed us perhaps this has freed us up um you know in a, in a, in a way over the last 12 months but yes, that's 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 what I feel like we've got to at the moment. Thanks, James. Uh, thanks for sharing. I think you've touched on a few things that we'll pick up in um, discussion for sure. I've just popped in the chat uh, your definition. Please do correct that if that's a wrong there. You mentioned uh, decol, and that would be the decolonization conversations that we've been having as um, staff teams, and 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 hopefully, uh, I know with your course, James, you've been actively having that with your students as well. Um, so, and also just to say that uh, previous lab sessions, including the Meet uh, Hindosha session that James uh, mentioned, can be found on our blog at wca3dlab.myblog.ars.ac.uk. And I'll pop that in the chat there as well. Brilliant. Thanks, James. I think that's really helpful. And you mentioned something about levelling, and there's, there's something in that in terms of situational sites of making suddenly being all over the world in people's kitchens, lounges, gardens, as well as studios, and now within the workshops again that we are able to. Um, seems like a good point to bring in Fabian. Um, if Fabian can come and share just uh, five, seven minutes about your context, what, what's kind of stood out to you this year, uh, some of the challenges. Um, I, I, I would like to echo James in many ways. Uh, um, I feel um, that we work in a very similar way and uh, making as a research is something that you, you, you listed as one way to define what we are trying to do here and, uh, and it's, it's an integral part on how we, we believe sh our course should work and that, um, that, that you don't research, you stop and you start making. This one instru instructs the other in terms of your you're finding out about uh, context and and uh, design or art aesthetics and other professionals that comes alongside your understanding with your affinities with materiality so that uh, you understand what you're looking for through the 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 successes and barriers through uh, you, you one encounters through making and uh, um, as a, as a course, we are not specific, and we are not bound by any material process uh, specific. And we 
especially earlier on in the first year, in year one and two of product and furniture design, we uh, try to uh, create a, an environment or a, a studio culture that promotes the invest material investigation in a very broad sense, including things to including things that um, perhaps a, a, a wrong, the one that knows how to do things would, wouldn't do them precisely in that way. But the discovery of how uh, things come together and, and perhaps the mistakes on the way help someone understand their affinities, whether you know their affinity lies with uh, resistant materials or with flexible materials, moldable materials, or something you construct. This is something that we need to create this space for self-discovery. And, uh, and uh, I, I have worked very closely with, uh, with Richard and we discussed these successes and failures on this, on this journey together all the time. And, and, and we probably will enter this, this uh, conversation later, but uh, you know, the, 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 the difficulty of perhaps allowing this to happen in the current situation uh, and uh, the limitations that working partially online bring. And, uh, and I suppose even this conversation has started because uh, when you approached me, as uh, she said, uh, that, uh, and Claire said that uh, we wanted to discuss a little bit uh, materiality in the context of being perhaps limited uh, by uh, the, pan the current pandemic and this and that. And uh, I feel that the opportunity to discuss this here is so timely because we are immersed in this and we are all trying to, to keep our heads above the water. But it's actually the time to uh, unpick what we did and how to do. And also uh, perhaps the the, the the, the positive uh, uh, aspects that it's generated by forcing us to look at new ways of doing things. Um, yeah, so I, I, if I, I, I feel that I have most of the time questions and lesser definitions and, and, uh, and I'm really happy to be here discussing this with, with you all really. Brilliant. Thanks, Fabian. I think you've really picked up some wonderful things there. Uh, we met up last week um, uh, in preparation for this meeting and R uh, Richard um, mentioned this idea of making as a conduit as, as something that is linked intrinsically with well-being. And we've certainly seen that in some respects. If you can enable a student to make where they're at or, uh, like you say, to explore their affinities uh, and to provide the safe environment for that. Um, and what does that environment look like? Like you say, there's lots of questions in terms of how we, how do we set that up? What does that, you know, what does that entail? We do know that now it, it can be anywhere and it could be super flexible, right? Um, I wondered if you could share a little bit about, uh, we, we talked about the um, locality. And so as much as like affinity to the material, you've also encouraged your students to kind of discover their cities, because most of your students are international, if I understand correctly, or quite broadly international anyways. Um, could you share a little bit about how you've engaged them, not only with the kind of immediate spaces that they have access yeah. to? Well, so I, I, I'll give you a little bit of context, perhaps, so that we we were we are new course at Chelsea and I I be I'm the head of year one and uh, we we co we were running a, a course at Camberwell three D three D design and we when we moved to Chelsea we, we kind of set, had a similar uh, approach and uh, wanted to do some of the things that we felt were very successful but the move to Chelsea many things many important things change and, and perhaps one of the biggest one, ones is the number of students that joined in. We suddenly, and I think it's, to do also, it's partly to do with the name of the course, so changing to product and furniture design is something perhaps the students find it really tangible to understand what it is. It, it, they can visualize product and furniture, perhaps 3D is a little bit abstract. Is uh, The staff 
and everything it was all the same most of the projects were very similar but i think the tangibility of product and furniture design was something that gave students a, a bridge to understand what they could achieve at the end of this and uh, and we had this very intense unit of uh, experiencing uh, a, a range of processes and they were most they were wood metal and ceramics and there were these very kind of fast and furious rotations through uh, three weeks in each material practice with a with a short project linked and we w went to Chelsea building up like this communication, new types of communications with the workshops. And there was obviously a massive change in the structure of, uh, of the workshops at that time. So I think everybody was trying to find the new ways to do things. I think it was an interesting moment, actually. And, um, and we set everything and it worked really well. And then uh, for the first year, and then when we had to do it again for the following year, we had to do it partly from home. <laughs> so uh, experiencing ceramics or, or, or metal or wood from home is a very, is a different experience <laughs> to say the least. And uh, so we, we were still kind of, the, 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 the workshops were, did an amazing job in, convert, in, in, in doing the demonstrations online but for me, one of the most interesting uh, situations was I was actually leading the ceramics project and then suddenly my students had to go everywhere in the world and I had students in 19 different countries. So I was starting tutorials in Shanghai at 8.30 in the morning and finishing in Texas at 6 in the afternoon and going through everywhere from Egypt to Russia and everywhere in between. And then suddenly it occurred to me and we were discussing that this, everyone can get a, a ceramics, clay, something you can get anywhere, right? And then I remember in New Cross, there is, a, I'm in Southeast London, in New Cross, there is a community kiln. And I just said to some students, I don't you find out whether there are community kilns where you are and we can carry on with this, what we're doing and what you learn in the workshops in the inductions. And uh, suddenly, all the students were trying to find what there was. They never even knew exactly what they were looking for, but it was extremely successful. When suddenly someone in Shanghai find, finds a kiln that they can use, and someone in Poland finds a kiln that they can, can use, someone in Dubai and Paris and Hanover and uh, Venezuela, and every, all these students are connected to their locality, and they are making, showing us, taking pictures of all these... Um, uh, things that they are learning in the workshop and added that techniques that the people that were working there were bringing on board as well and suddenly it felt extremely uh internationally local <laughs> in a bizarre way but i love that and i think um there's something really like in the in your beginning you mentioned that your course is not necessarily bound by the material but more the kind of exploration or approach to and I think that's a phenomenally enabling way of thinking to uh, re and that's probably some of the thinking behind making literacies are or articulating them in some way is this articulating an approach or, or a way of discovery or very much like you say making as research you know uh, mm -hmm. that actually can take you from material to material to material um, but then there's also this really lovely thing of of also allowing people to still explore um, those basic materials you know wood metal uh, ceramics but in a way that then suddenly makes people the students or makes everyone connected to their actual locality which is phenomenally enabling in an in another way as well but that's brilliant Fabian thank you um, there's lots of food for thought there that we can unpack in a moment I just want to bring um, Richard uh, Barton in who um, has worked really closely with Fabian this last year, just to share some of his thoughts um, about making and this moment that we find ourselves in. It's really interesting this last this last year and sort of looking at making what it is. I mean, obviously I've worked in um, sort of technical support for quite a few years now. And uh, if I was to have given you an answer as to sort of like what I thought the importances were of making uh, a few years ago, it would have been around sort of materiality and exploring it much like Fabian was saying, I, I think that's kind of like where we 
connected in terms of how we sort of push this course forward. But what I found incredibly interesting is when we moved to a situation where we were online, we were in these remote situations, the, the importance that others found in making um, was actually quite reassuring and, um, and a, a, a sort of a beautiful thing to see unfold because you, you kind of wonder whether it's an affiliation you have you, yourself with something like this and perhaps whether you're sometimes pursuing something that others don't necessarily value as high. And I mean, I think one of the most amazing sort of parts for me was when we first went into lockdown and many courses, you know, for the sake of um, ease of assessment and things like that, to remove the making aspects seemed like the logical approach. So, you know, how can we how can we sort of put, push these units, units forward in a way that we aren't relying on people to have resources at home? Um, and it seemed like a, a sort of a valid approach to begin with. But then seeing how that affected people's design and you know but kind of like how was touched upon earlier about the idea of making as a as a language as a design tool as a conduit all of these sorts of things it just sort of like enforced it more and more and um there was it was quite wonderful a member of my team steph who i believe is in this call now and perhaps later on he'd like to say a little bit himself but in the first lockdown, it was kind of difficult for Steph because, you know, a lot of this making had been removed and he's a studio technician that does a lot of model making, but yeah, a lot of lecturing on material practice. And when the briefs were revisited and actually we could put the making back in, but in a remote context, you really started to see the, the weight that this, um, this sort of making had in terms of informing their, their decisions and their designs. But much like you mentioned earlier, Steph, um, Ash, about the, um, the the well-being aspect, you just really saw this lift in students' approaches and students' feelings towards how they engaged with the subject as a whole. And it was, you know, it wasn't necessarily just these making aspects of the project. I think it was a whole subject that that, that really benefited from some from the reintroduction of making and that sort of revitalised feeling that you saw coming through the students and. That was kind of the moment for me where I realised sort of the, the importance of that experimentation, but also that sort of like tangible hands on practice. And, you know, we've, we've probably sold ourselves the CCW, especially as a sort of college that does more hands on making, you know, hence how our courses and, and our resources are quite evenly matched like that. But it, it sort of reinforced to me in, in the actual students that we're taking on that that very much is um, an important part of how we work as a as an institution, I think. So Fabian, you mentioned making as research, kind of learning through making, um, and James and I have been really thinking through um, moving um, the kind of making closer or integrating that with design, much like Fabian's um, um, mention there of making as research. Um, so kind of making making as a thinking tool, as a design tool in itself, starting with materials and maybe working backwards or forwards, depending on how you see it, uh, to a kind of design. And I just wondered, um, James, you, you mentioned making as glue uh, last week as, a, as connection. And I wondered whether you wanted to pick up on that um, in kind of uh, how we've talked about locality, but then also, this idea of um, making it as quite central to well-being, or, or or maybe in the sense of going as far as it's you know part of our humanity in some senses, there needs to be some sort of physical making sense of the world around us in some shape or form. Yeah, it, that, that again is just it's just one of my it's one of my you know favourite bang on about it to students quotes the the design as glue rather than the skin of things, and in, in theatre it happens quite a lot. People think of design when people who don't know theatre design think of it, they think that it's a pretty painted backdrop and some nice clothes. And you kind of go, well, actually, no, it's not, the, it's not the skin of the thing, it's the skeleton, it's the glue, it's the thing that holds everything together. And I, again, I feel like that works into making really well because there's just so many angles that you can look at it from. I think, I think you're, you're really right, Richard. Every, every bit of feedback we get from students the, the moments that are flagged are actually moments of making when they give their when they give their how was this unit unit for you so those of us that are in the room with them kind of as the as the as the constant presence actually the 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 beats where we've been able to to cross over our thinking 
actually those are the those are the beats that are that are celebrated by students as they go oh and then someone and we learned to do a thing and as they're making the thing so as they're doing folding or they're they're listening to people like talk about something that doesn't have a direct connection the levels of inspiration just lift for the whole for the whole unit and it's it's been such a it's been such an inspiring thing that ties in throughout again like uh, joe's on call but kind of joe's sound workshops with them even though sound design is perhaps not what you would think of as the core of our theater design course actually how those sound projects influence their spatial design is really um it's really wonderful and it's it's not just it's not just us saying that as a as a kind of as our own little echo chamber that's the that's the students feeding back and going these are the moments that we're going to kind of pick as highlights highlights throughout the course so i think that's been i think that's been great and i think kind of connected to that it feels like there's been space this year for a kind of celebration of this kind of thinking whereas before there's a sense of you're going project to project to project and there's a thing to solve and so you're running from this room to that room to the other room actually there's been a bit of a in amongst all of the awfulness of this year there's been a bit of space to take a breath and go here is someone you will have seen around a lot and when they're not with you look they've got this whole life and practice and this is what they've been working on this is what they've been doing so it feels like that um i really liked uh, i really like discover uh, so people can discover their affinities uh, it's not a phrase I, but but of course because we've all got materials that we respond to better or worse and you go and you go oh just just being able to enjoy that and celebrate affinities that already exist and go here's someone that really loves sitting with tin snips and cutting small bits of metal and folding them and here's someone that loves doing this thing and here's someone that loves and you just go there's such a there's been so again that enthusiasm is just infectious isn't it it just it feeds from moment to moment and i feel like that is felt by the students i hope that's felt by the students i mean there's some of them in the call they can disagree in the chat um, that sort of makes me think about um a bit of what um fabian was saying in terms of the environment like uh, so we've been like you know bef bef 2019 you know what's it bc before covid um we were fully on, uh, physical weren't we like we didn't uh, some courses potentially had an online environment in some aspect, but not as a core aspect. So uh, we were fairly uh, teaching embodied practice in an embodied space in physical studios and workshops. Um, and then we suddenly go bang onto this fully online environment, teaching embodied practice that is physical and body centric you know you need to pick up things and speak to things and push things and um push and pull and exert force and um on materials and um to suddenly being in um embodied practice in disembodied spaces so this kind of online space and uh, um and but now we we're shifting again that it, it sort of feels like we're this is a process isn't it we're we're quickly evolving we're doing in sort of we're changing at the speed of what we've never changed uh, before in this institution um and I, I guess that creates opportunities for us but i wondered if you could reflect on um this changing approach to now what could we harness about this kind of unmooring of um making um itself like you know we've spoken about having approaches to making not necessarily be you know having the flexibility to the approach of what we're teaching materially wise like more kind of trying to disseminate an, an, an approach um or a or a kind of guidance to uh, discovery in some shape or form um but this flexibility of in making itself and the shift of focus on that and also the flexibility of uh, and support as to where that occurs. So how does that work uh, in this now blended environment, lim potentially limited access a little bit to site, although Fabian, you've come up with great solutions with a massive marquee in the uh, yard, uh, is it the parade ground at Chelsea, um, which is just a bigger space, a bit more COVID 
safe uh, for students to access um, in the numbers that you have? Um, that's quite a long question, but I think that there's just there's two things there, changing approach to making itself and like maybe a slight, like a loosening or a flexibility on like what that actually looks like. Fabian, maybe you can chat about the, your embroidery and electrics and the affinities between those two processes. Um, and then also just this flexibility of where making is occurring. So I'll, I'll chuck that out to uh, either which one of you who would like to respond. I'm happy to go, and uh, but maybe it would be nice if it's maybe a conversation between uh, Richard and I, because I think it was not a, like a, 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 a light bulb moment, moment where let's do this. It was kind of a, more like bumping your head against the wall sort of situation. Uh, but one thing that when everything went online, perhaps I, don't, I, I feel I, that I feel that what happened was every, everything became a massive presentation. That is presenting the whole time. There isn't the moment of the messy desk or the messy space where the students think that they're doing this special thing here, but you catch in the corner of your eye the thing that they didn't see at the back of the table over there. You don't see that anymore. You just see the presentation. <laughs> and, uh, and there are good things about the presentation. I think it makes students and us more organized. <laughs> and uh, kind of preparing because there is a, a preparation aspect to do the presentation and some editing and there is the, is, is a useful tool but the the this the, the kind of a we call it that the, the the unplanned risk so the risk that you don't know the results the test that you actually don't know the outcome the real test those that people tend to ditch, we lost them. So we wanted to bring come back to them, but keeping this ability to perhaps plan and organize that the online uh, environment allowed us to do, I feel. And also we had obviously to deal with the number situation in the workshop. That was a practical thing that we that, that we couldn't we couldn't shift. So um, uh, in, in terms of a. Uh, uh, broadening the uh, possibilities of affinities as we're all enjoying the word at the moment uh, we we try to bring up a new of possibilities there and uh, something i felt for years that if our courses product and furniture design or 3d design were missing was textiles uh we we have massive connections with soft products and we were not dealing with softness we were dealing with hard stuff the whole time and, uh, and, and, and lighting and electronics. And I felt that, here we go, there's an opportunity to try something new. And uh, I, uh, I, I said to Richard, Richard, I'm thinking of this, you think it's a, a bad idea? We have not, we don't, even, we have just a couple of sewing machines. <laughs> That's all we have. And I can't sew. So is this, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Richard was really encouraging and kind of, we kind of, uh, 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 start to kind of imagine what this would be like and how it would perhaps take advantage of, uh, of resources we currently have. And I'm talking about not just spaces, but most importantly, people. We have an amazing textiles department in the building next door and we have absolutely no connection. So uh, Richard began a dialogue, which became uh, amazing. And then uh, we start to, you know, explore the may, uh, stitching more specifically, but not only, uh, and uh, and brought electronics on board and found out uh, uh, crossovers between, um, you know, you're stitching uh, sequins or you're st stitching cord. It's the same process for stitching electronics and batteries into garment or putting uh, wires into garment and so suddenly we had an electronics uh, uh, tutor and uh, a textile tutor uh, and uh, new staff all working together it was all designed together wasn't it Richard? Absolutely yeah I think you know it really um, it, it took advantage of a of a situation as well you know like we we were we were put into a position where we, like you say, we continued doing the presentation style where students would 
make things and just sort of like and just present them to us and and you know we were stuck in that quite circular motion or okay we do something completely different and and i think that was it was an opportunity that we probably wouldn't have been it wouldn't have been entertained in a normal circumstance mm -hmm. because you know it was kind of like well if it ain't broke don't fix it sort of thing but we all knew underneath that there were you know we were kind of stretching the boundaries of, of what course could operate within and you know with it growing more and more and like what you said about the sort of uh, the course name and the site sort of changing the students that we had it was time to do something so i think in that way we're quite we're quite grateful of, of it sort of bringing that to it but i think you know more than anything like what you were saying about the sort of seeing alternative things happen on the corner of the desk people taking a, a project and, and running in a completely different direction you you've got that back again you, you sort of lost that in the remote but you know considering that we were teaching the students uh, stitch you saw sort of sewing machine use and sort of some of these uh, basic programming and um, electronics the directions they took it in were really varied you know they they went into completely different corners with how they they presented it and the show ended up so varied in the end that it it, it almost felt like um it had more of a feel for me of like a sort of a final year project you know where people had all run in different directions and they were they were producing things of their own sort of specialism so i think it, it had incredibly sort of positive effects in terms of how it encouraged people to explore but mm -hmm. also it was it was amazing how much of it was still transferable to an online session I mean, you and i were both very worried about how we would reach students abroad and how this would actually sort of integrate um, and obviously there's certain parts of it that were always going to be very difficult but in terms of like um, stitching and sort of going through those sessions for anybody that you probably you're all aware once you sort of move to online teaching you you really lose that immediate feedback and when you're talking to the camera and you're sort of addressing a room you don't really know how much students are following you along and uh, for, for us especially in this you know, initial sort of stitch session for us to say to the students you know turn on your cameras upload your, your images onto Padlet and to see how many of them have been following along um, a bit like what James was saying about those sort of peak moments in projects you know it's, it's almost like everybody was looking forward to it and they got all their stuff with them they had things like embroidery hoops which we just didn't expect them to be able to sort of like source in time and everybody was there making and they showed us all these things and yeah we had um 10 students in the studio but we had this global community at the same time all having this conversation through images as well as dialogue in terms of how they were they were pushing forward with it so it was quite remarkable how you know what turned what, what was basically born out of us being sort of frustrated that we couldn't push the course the way we wanted to we actually found a, a whole new avenue which I think now you'd probably agree with it, Fabian, that you wouldn't want to actually sort of go back from. Yeah, I, in a, in, in, you're so right. In, in this bizarre way, we actually need to, the, the, the challenge of, uh, of the not being able to do things as we used to do to find alternative ways of doing it. And what was interesting, the notion of the blended became really blended. So we, we use a cap the capacity of the room where the, 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 the demos were happening. So we have, you know, 10 students there uh, or five students if it was based on sewing machines. The other one's online. So the, 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 the person doing the demonstration had students there to really be able to address the time issues and all of those things in real time and um, and then the people that are on like putting stuff on padlet and another thing that was interesting with electronics was that we were using three different rooms and we had big screens in each of the rooms with the same demo but the students were present in the building but just in separate rooms and then jonathan could walk between room and room and then do one-to-ones or groups but respecting room capacity and all of that so it was we had tried so many things and learned a great deal. I think that really speaks into, yeah, a little bit of uh, a spotlight. In, or it's quite a hopeful picture, isn't it? Like even the uncomfortability and the stress and the frustration that this, this year has brought 
um, that it's actually immensely hopeful in that there's opportunity everywhere to kind of really develop and flex our practice. Um, and uh, the word exploit comes to mind, but it's not exploiting, but the breakdown of, of silos, really. Uh, you know, just the fact that you had this wonderful resource of the textile kind of course right next to you, but not much of a channel uh, for you to both kind of have be a kind of um, uh, a bit of osmosis between the two of you. Um, and I, I, Liz, and also uh, Chris in the chat has just said online allowed learning of different subjects, uh, you know, access to recordings um, across a number of areas, allowed understanding of how other subjects connect with your own subjects and making. And um, it just brings to mind, James is um, an incredible champion of the lab sessions that we've been running um, as a 3D lab. Um, and just really harnessing, uh, I keep, we, we run a session and then a couple of weeks later, I'll see them pop up in uh, James's uh, online classes in some shape or form. Um, and I think that's wonderful in the sense of, um, and really maybe that's the picture of where the institution uh, you know, can continue to grow and thrive is that if we open up as coral reefs, as it were, where they, you know, people can come in, uh, touch, touch base in lots of different avenues and areas that actually what wonderful uh, new ways of making and doing and being could, it, could evolve. Um, but I wonder whether there's something about us becoming just more magpie-like, um, uh, and also with, e with each other as well, like um, seeing each other as, as resources. Um, so I, that brings us to a bit of uh, time just to bring um, Claire in, and Claire in the chat just kind of has, um, lim you know, kind of documented some of um, what we've been chatting about, uh, one of which, you know, I think that was um, James's quote is joy happens in the lines of communication and sharing between specialisms. So that kind of breakdown of silos and kind of knowledge exchange and allowing that to happen more freely. Um, and then limitations versus in innovation. Maybe Claire, you can reflect on that. Um, I'm loving the arrows that you have in there. Uh, and then online the kind of paradox being inter uh, internationally connected whilst physically disconnected. And I think that was in connection to you, Fabian, um, in, in terms of yeah, the wonderful paradox of actually, yeah, we are disconnected in this kind of weird online space, but actually we're then reconnecting people to their locality um, as well as each other yeah, in that way. Um, but I wonder if I could hand over to you, uh, Claire, just to kind of offer up some, some thoughts as you've um, been a custodian of these sessions. Yeah, no, there were loads of like really beautiful gems that, you know, I haven't managed to capture all of them, but yeah, I think something about limitations breeding, you know, when you have to sort of condense things in, they find a way to mushroom out in unexpected ways. And I think, yeah, being online has been uncomfortable and felt quite flattened in a way. But um, yeah, the interesting things and sort of innovative ways of working that have mushroomed. I think, yeah, there's there's more that we can get out of that. Um, I really, yeah, loved, um, Fabian, how you talked about the messy desk bit. And I remember as a, you know, as an art student myself or doing bits of teaching in colleges, you know, be talking to people and, yeah, you'd be searching around and it would always be the bits maybe that a student or even yourself have dis disregarded. And actually it's the way somebody's piling something or, you know, all of their books and it's all really precarious and toppling. And that tells you by as much about their kind of um, sensibility to making and how they use materials as to, you know, or more so in a way than the finished product that they want to show you. Um, so yeah, that kind of behind the scenes bit that you, it's harder to get at, I guess, online when mm. nobody wants to show the sort of more vulnerable, unfinished bits of themselves and their work. Yes, I have, because frequently they are looking for something sleek and perfect because there is a, 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 a clear vision of what they want to achieve. And, and I think us, as you know, uh, uh, people that have been 
can, in, in a position to, to help them see what they are making. It's like, but look at this. You also made this thing. It may not be the thing you in, is in your head imagining that you're going to get to, but there's something very interesting. Can you control this? Can you shape this? Can you file this now? That sort of conversation uh, is, uh, uh, is possible if we don't have the filter of the edited presentation. And, uh, and uh, I, I think I, I'm not going to dismiss the whole aspect of the presentation because it really helps students to prepare what they're going to say, to detach much more uh, uh, and kind of see with a certain distance and describe and, uh, and uh, with the distance what, what they involved in. Uh, but uh, can we keep both in a way? I think blended, not in the blended the, the way the word was conceived, but perhaps in a new type of blended that we kind of are, uh, are able to, to be close and detached. So like looking at a painting, close and far, that sort of thing. Mm. Makes me think as well, you know, particularly with Wimbledon being, you know, a performance school now and you know, how can presentations online become more performative, more creative, you know, like how can technology and that kind of, you know, a really slick kind of glossy, shiny technology, how can, how can presentations become messy or, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm thinking of Emma Hart, I don't know if you know Emma Hart, contemporary artist had a show few years ago at Camden Arts Centre and just this idea of like um, corrupting technology like dirtying it like really playful kind of you know disrupting those surfaces I think. And it also speaks into you know I think we have lots of questions about what is an effective learning space right now but it, it or an effective making space but partly about these um, uh, making literacies is really to empower and enable students where they're at with what they have, regardless of where they're at, you know. And um, I mean, I guess there's a desire there to be inclusive as much as you can, even though this time has definitely showed up uh, an inequality of what students do have access to compared to each other. But I wonder if it, it's moving towards um, holding space, you know, what is a, an effective holding space that could be messy or it can be clean or, you know, it's this kind of floating space whilst people find their affinities like Fabian, you mentioned. I think that's lovely, this idea of kind of really just being an encouraging space. And I think one of the first making literacy kind of intro sessions we ran, James, with your first years, some of which are in the core. Um, I had a response with uh, a, an email straight afterwards by a student who just reflected on like the confidence that that session gave them, even though we were just playing with a bit of paper uh, and just being really encouraging and just encouraging the process. Um, but there was just this wonderful like, uh, yeah, notion that I realized that we can still empower, we can still enable um, students to be makers. And, and allow them to, you know, I don't know, help along um, this discovery of affinities or of material or processes uh, or approaches. Um, well, I'm just gonna uh, just throw open to any kind of lasting uh, responses. I know Steph ha uh, put into the, the chat, which is a great summary, really. Uh, thanks for summarizing, summarizing the session up. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's Steph who's, um, a studio tech on the uh, materials and uh, the material and spatial practices program and he says um, it's so true that the requirement to adapt has led us uh, to, uh, or led to a surge of innovation and discovery often going back to basic uh, basics tools and materials have led us to realize the value and possibilities with these and develop our own way of thinking through making uh, which is a wonderful kind of lovely summary um, but just in case there's any other uh, little last bits of burning desire to kind of share, um, we might call it a day there. But um, uh, Fabian, Richard, James, is there anything else that you'd just like to sign off with? Um, I'd love to just really quickly flag your coral reefs thing. I think that's a really, I think that's just a really wonderful phrase. And I think there's something about 
the I think Richard kind of touched upon this where your where your resources are and this sense of being then they're not in this closed room obviously there are, there are practicalities behind these things as well but but that idea of a coral reef the idea of the interactions the idea of kind of actually being able to pick your brain and pull that into the studio really quickly was so good so you know I'm delighted to have stolen all your best ideas over the last year thanks very much Ash um but but that's but I think actually it's been it's been really because when you you can get so focused on what's happening in your room that like you say there's someone just across the corridor and sometimes these conversations here because you might be having wider conversations than I might be having it's been really good because you've gone oh stage and screen who are just down the corridor they're doing this you should try that and you go why haven't I made that short walk and 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 I haven't and I and so I think that's part of what we're coming together around making but actually it's just that it comes down to the empowering and enabling and it's not just about facilitating we started with our frustration about you know someone comes to the end of their project and they run to you and go oh, can you help me make this and you go it's too late that like that's that's not the time to start the conversation it's right at the beginning and that enabling and empowering and coral reefs for me feels like the the best of the things that 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 have been talked about kind of today and then all of the kind of 3d lab sessions i've really enjoyed it um i just uh well first of all i i am so happy to have kind of been here and seen the opportunity having the opportunity to discover all these things that if you know you've you've been doing and discussing and finding out and actually to everyone that's here listening to us if you have any thoughts any ideas anything you want to try out send me an email let's try it let's just have a go you know i'm 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 up for trying i want to find out what you guys are doing see stuff um i just uh, you know i just feel that sometimes we are the, the door at the end of the corridor not talking to the other and i would love to to you know take a step towards changing this and uh, uh you know let's keep the conversation going please <laughs> amazing i think that's a great call to action isn't it just to yeah just to seize the opportunity of being in an institution together and having access you know we're just on the other side of an email really um richard um i just wanted to um i just wanted to sort of reinforce that really i mean i think in this in the strangest possible way we should all be kind of grateful that the pandemic's gone on so long and i know that's a really hard thing to sort of um to appreciate, um, especially when it's been so difficult for so many of us. But I think it it stuck around long enough to really force us to to shift our thinking. Um, anything shorter than this, we would have been very quick to go, right, it's over, let's just carry on. But it's it's disrupted on such a level that it's actually managed, to, you know, within our institution. I think we've been very fortunate. It has actually encouraged us to, to and really sort of positive practice um, and I just hope that that mentality and that way of thinking can continue and much like what Fabian was saying I, I just encourage everyone to, to sort of take stock think about what it is that they do want to do and you know let's let's try and invoke a very a positive approach sort of a can do let's let's try it sort of thing because you know at the end of the day there's there's so many different ways to undertake the what we thought was a very specific sort of uh, approach so um let's let's keep keep testing the boundaries let's keep sort of interrogating our own sort of sense of safety and security within the practice i think mm -hmm. and on that note richard we are incredibly grateful that you are moving to the workshop strand and to continue this way of thinking and to help us kind of pivot workshops in that way. So 3D Lab is really looking forward to working definitely more closely with you. Uh, and Fabian, I would love to kind of continue these chats. And we, we didn't mention your early lab at all, but um, I'd really be interested um, in uh, talking to you further about that. I give a big thanks to, um, to, our, to our guests, to Richard, to Fabian, to James. Thank you so much for being generous with your time. and. Um, and yeah, just, uh, you know, in no way is this a, a closure of the conversation. I think it's really just a, a real quick snapshot and an opening uh, that will hopefully be a bit of a longer conversation as we go. Um, 
uh, you know, making sense doesn't happen in an instant. It happens in process as we as we go. Um, so just to uh, yeah, give a big round of a uh, virtual applause to to these guys for their time and just for um, helping us think through some of the the bigness of this year and all that it's brought us. Uh, and a big thanks to Claire Mitten, who has always been a champion of the 3D Lab guest sessions and a quiet collaborator, really, all throughout um, us doing those sessions. And uh, if you could give Wimbledon Space a follow, you'll find out more about these events um, uh, at Wimbledon Space on Instagram and also on the What's On page on our website as well.